one. Hey everybody, welcome to House Six, our movie podcast about movies and our journey through history's best pictures. We are on best picture number 10, and it is The Life of Emil Zola from 1937. So before we get into it, Jared, Jared how, just how are we on go. 10 and we're still on 37? Don't make sense. We got news <laughs> for you, Jared. It's next time we have a musical. And then oh, the great. time after that, we have a very long epic. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, so before we get into it, we always like to start with oh, our shoot. three word summation of the movie we just watched that Michael just has to think up right now. So we won't start with him. We will start with Jared. What do you got for us, Jared? I have two, and it's full circle. All right, Thomas. Close that window. <laughs> uh, I'll go next, I guess. I'll go words as pictures. Words as pictures. We're never going to give a description, are we? <laughs> I forgot about that. Three, three words, Michael. All you three need is words. three or, or less or less. It could be or one. Could be one what word. pops into your head when you think about this movie? Uh, writer, painter, trial. <laughs> okay. There you go. We got it. All Creative right. Writing so... 101 little back, background on the awards. The 10th Academy Awards were held March 10th, 1938 at the Los Angeles Biltmore Hotel and hosted by Bob Burns. Burns was a musical comedian who was famous for creating and playing an instrument he called the bazooka. In World War II, soldiers called their anti-tank rocket launchers bazooka. And since then... The name has stuck with the weapon. So just a little little side trivia for there. <laughs> check Stole out it. check out our new uh channel, History of Weapons <laughs> <laughs> Names. <laughs> I got this. Let's do this. <laughs> oh, the ceremony was originally scheduled for March 3rd, but was delayed by the 1938 Los Angeles flood, one of the largest floods in Southern California history. Luis Rayner, who we saw in the previous year in The Great Zigfield, was the first person to win two acting awards and to win them back-to-back. -back. Unaware that winning back-to-back -back awards was possible, Rayner had to get dressed and run down to the venue to receive her award. A Day at the Races is the only Marx Brothers film to receive an Oscar nomina nomination that year when it, when it was nominated for Best Dance Direction. The landmark feature-length animated film Snow White in the Seven Dwarves was only nominated for one Oscar, an oversight that the Academy acknowledged the next year when they awarded the film an honorary award. Disney's The Old Mill won the Best Animated Short. Director uh, Miyazaki has called it his favorite Disney film. It's a good one. Do you guys remember that one? Which so, like, one? When the Old Mill so it's the one where the storm hits like the old windmill and the animals are like hiding in it. It's got that famous shot where the birds like almost gets crushed by the gear, but it's in the broken. It's a good one. You guys should check I'm it really out. I'm really trying to remember this one. <laughs> um, little side tangent. My favorite Mickey Mouse one came from 1935. It's the band concert. So it's the one where like the tornado hits the band. That one's... That one was even nominated, so I was sad. Um, <laughs> the Life of Emil Zola was the first film ever with 10 nominations, winning the year's most with three awards, and was second, and it was the second straight biographical film to win Best Picture. It was the first year every Best Picture nominee received multiple nominations. The original version of A Star is Born was the first color film to be nominated for Best Picture. And Best Picture nominee, Captain Courageous, starred Spencer Tracy, who won that year for Best Actor. So, a little about the movie. The Life of Emil Zola was from Warner Brothers Pictures and was directed by William Dettiri. I, I said that wrong, but he can write me and tell me how to say it. <laughs> and stars Paul Mooney. Mooney would be nominated for Best Actor five times and one for his role in the story of Louis Pasteur as the title character. He's probably best known for as playing the title role in the original Scarface. 
The Life of Emile Zola was this, um, is the story of the French author in his involvement in the scandalous Dreyfus Affair. The film production was marred by conflict by the film's producers, Henry Blanc and Hal B. Wallace, with arguments from everything from the story, film, title, into the lead actress. The climactic courtroom scene, or the climb, the sorry, the courtroom scene was shot in one take, in one six minute take, but Wallace requested that cuts be thrown in to add the crowd. The film was a great financial success and was hailed as the best bi biopic film to that point. Modern critics have criticized the film for failing to address the anti Semitism that was a key factor in the Dreyfus affair. So, before we get to the plot, we usually talk about the characters. This one has a lead character who kind of, we take a break from him and then we get another character that kind of takes over for a little bit. But so what did you guys think of the characters in this one? We'll start with the main character who was played by Paul Mooney. So what did you guys think of the title, uh, Emile Zola? Go for it. Um, so I like the progression of the character throughout the first, like 30, 40 minutes, I think kind of like that first, you know, you get introductory to him and his whole career, basically. Um, I didn't, the, the opening scene was kind of weird though, cause it seemed like it didn't fit throughout the rest of it. Um, I, I was very impressed with the guy's acting though, cause it seemed like he was each age that he portrayed. And I think the, I think black and white helps with uh, aging, like the makeup and stuff, because it's it's a lot easier to age somebody and seem natural. With like color, it's like obvious that they're it's makeup. So I think he did a good job. Hmm. That's a good point. True. Yeah. Uh, Chargo. Um, I'm trying to go with that. You say anything? I'm uh, sorry. Last time I went first, Michael yelled at me, and I'm scared. So <laughs> I, went, I never yell at you a day in my life, Jared. Um, I think you yell at him every day in your life. Yeah, I think I agree with with, with what you said, Thomas. I agree. I'm, I kind of like I liked him basically through the whole thing. His just kind of desire to tell the truth. I enjoyed a lot, and and kind of that pushing that into telling stories. You kind of see it as it's coming through, but it's very satisfying when he first tells that one woman's story, and he like you know, get that selling. It's just that kind of like redemption story of someone who is downtrodden so badly that, but it happens very, very quickly. And then it kind of just like you just have said, skips the middle bit where we see the other people. That, yeah. uh, that book progression scene. I, I really like that one where yeah, the, was good. the books just keep going, but it never reaches the end of it. I like that one. Yeah, it's like, take a chill, chill, dick, go, go on a vacation, dude. And they're writing. all dude, long, he, by the he way. He did write a long. <laughs> yeah. They're <laughs> all long. <laughs> He yeah. has like this series of twenty books. It's like I think they call it a cycle, and they yeah. it's just like twenty books of the same like two families or something. Like I was that. about to say, were they all like <laughs> nonfiction books that he wrote? I'm assuming. No, he wrote fiction. Okay, too. he he wrote fiction, but he also based a lot of it on the uh, events that were happening. Mm. That's why he was criticized so much because when people like read it, like I thought this was a fiction book, and then it's like it is fiction. <laughs> It's inspired by other things. It's inspired but... by events. Yeah. But no. Yeah. I agree. Kind of like the did. movie's opening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I liked. I liked his act. I thought that he did a really good job acting in his character arc through the whole thing. The the beginning scene you guys talked about. Like, was it just? Where did you guys watch this? YouTube. Amazon. YouTube. Amazon. And then I watched it on Apple. Was it just like really bad audio quality? Yeah. The, that, the audio did like, not like, transfer well. Like I'm having so much trouble just understanding what they're saying. And then it finally cleared, like even just the quality of the film looked bad. And then it kind of cleared up after that scene and moved on. I don't know why it just looked terrible and sounded terrible to me. Well, but... I even purchased, not purchased, but I rented on YouTube and the audio quality throughout the whole movie was either okay or just terrible. So hmm, I didn't really I, mean, I just got that. used to it after the beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like parts of it were, were all right, but there were some times where I had to, I had to put on subtitles. I'm like, I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> like I'm, I'm really having some trouble. So yeah. there was a lot of like that. I don't know what do you call it? That pop and crackle stuff in the audio, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that's just kind of, I, I kind of like that old, in old yeah. movies. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of like listening to an old vinyl or something. You just kind of appreciate it. Uh, Jared, did you want to say anything about the main character? 
I enjoyed his character when he was struggling, but like as when he was getting more rich and famous, I kind of lost endearment towards him, I guess. You're just and I just like didn't, his friend. And I just didn't really yeah, I had to leave. Like, what's his name? <laughs> I'm like, God, dude. dude, I gotta go to the homeland. <laughs> You're not fun anymore. You're not interesting. <laughs> Peace. That was a good line, though. I really like that line. It's like yeah. mm -hmm. you let or uh you left the struggling behind. I never left. I'm like, yeah. that's a good line. <laughs> yeah. Uh, with Paul. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I really like the character arc of his um character and just the growth that you show or he shows. So that was cool. Uh, and then our other kind of main character is the um, Alfred Dreyfus, who, of course, is related to Richard Dreyfus. It's one of his descendants. So, um, what did you guys? Dreyfus. Dreyfus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did you guys think of his character? Um, I, I So the letter scene where they get the intelligence leak. I really like that scene because it just shows the bureaucracy of what Zola was talking about, how it's just kind of, you know, stagnant and people think that they're better than they are. And uh, that one part where they're looking at, you know, who they think is responsible. And he's like, oh, how did this guy become uh, a member a member of the staff? And I was like, what is he talking about? And as soon as he said Dreyfus, I'm like, oh, no. And then <laughs> on the ledger, it says Jew. I'm like, oh, yeah. my God. Okay. <laughs> Um, I did like his character and kind of crazy. He looks just like the guy. If you look at yeah. pictures of, of Dreyfus, he looks just like him though. I didn't, I was surprised to see him all like white and everything else at the end of it though. That was like a very drastic turn of, mm -hmm. of, of, uh, appearance. So it was kind of, it was kind of cool though, that we had that 40 minute introduction to Zola and then almost we kind of just like leapt from him to somebody else, which I think was kind of cool. I was like, where's this going? So yeah. it's kind of an interesting, very interesting uh, way to tell the story. And yeah, mentioning someone who doesn't look like him, like Zola on the, I don't know where you guys rented it, if they had the poster, but the poster, the, the actor doesn't look anything like mm -hmm. Zola on the poster. So it's, that was funny. Nah, I didn't pay attention to it. It doesn't even look like the actor. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the, the, yeah, the, I was actually confused whenever they first started talking about the next section, whenever they're like, we need to find someone, you know, basically blame this on or find the, the mole. And I was like, how the hell are they going to make Zola the mole? <laughs> like, where, <laughs> where are they going with this? And then you get, yeah, introduced, introduced to the new character. And it's, we don't really, I don't really feel like we get that much of him. You just realize he's kind of an honorable guy doing his job in 20 years of work, whatever, and then just gets dealt a, one of the worst hands you probably could and then is tortured for however many years he's tortured um but yeah not much not, not not much i feel like to dive into his character honestly but it did good acting i thought but mm -hmm. yeah crazy is that that guy lived for a long time he served in world war two or world war one so Jeez. he lived a long time jared, ahead, jared. i Sorry. agree with michael um didn't get much but i did enjoy i enjoyed him as a character but not much to say yeah he's kind of just this guy that's like too good to be true i guess he doesn't he, he's <laughs> like this just honor bound soldier guy that you know he's gonna stand up for what's right the whole time and he's admirable but you don't get much from his character other than he kind of you know suffers for his convictions like thomas said they chose him you know suffering in prison with the long hair and everything um what about other characters there's not a lot of like fleshed out characters but there's a lot of good parts um I, I thought they would make more of his wife but we didn't really get a lot of her and she also uh, didn't seem to age that much by the way of zola's yeah. wife yeah which is funny because they introduce her in the first scene yeah and the, but she's not his wife yet but they don't really clarify that and she's like the suitor and then <laughs> i did like that's like i found you or his mom's like i found you a job he's like do you hear a job <laughs> yeah <laughs> what is it <laughs> wait what's I can't the be job doing anything here. Yeah. um but i did like uh i think jared's mentioned him uh is it paul right Paul's his friend yeah. his his suffering artist friend that he was roommates with um 
that was a that was a really good character moment for him in in Zola. So uh, even though we don't really get to see much of him, that was a really good scene. So any other characters? Bits and pieces of them, but just really their moments rather than the actual character itself. But yeah, I like the lawyer. The Zola's yeah, lawyer is really good. good. Just kept trying to call out the the, the hide, do whatever the because uh, yeah. Is called. So you'd be really frustrated if you're going through that, and the judge kept saying, "No, I can't do that." <laughs> no, that deals with that. No, that deals with that. Uh, and then up. there's the wife of Dreyfus. She had a pretty good scene mm. in there. Yeah, she was good. So, yeah. All right, so let's get into the plot. We start with the WB Shield, um, and it explains that this is a true story, even though some things have been changed and some names have been changed. Uh, we go to 1862, and we get a couple of poor artists in their little shack. Um, they're really cold. Zola is really cold, um, so he's trying to plug up all the holes in the shack. Uh, and Paul's like, you're never going to do it, man. We're going to be cold forever. <laughs> um, and this kind of foreshadows things to come with him, uh, you know, when they're, like, coughing because of the fire and stuff. Um and then Zola kind of explains like his or, or they explain their art form where they want to you know show the stark face of truth he doesn't want to sugarcoat things just to make money and stuff like that uh Emil's mother comes in and here and she's got his lady friend with them um at first they think it's just someone to cor uh, collect the rent so they're like hide in the bed <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you're really really sick uh, like Thomas said, the mom has got him a job, and um, it's with a publishing uh, company, so that's kind of perfect for a writer. Uh, so we go, and he's working there, but we find out he still has no money. Um, he's getting advances on his paycheck. His wife says the butcher's not going to give him any more food. He goes, and he talks to his boss, and... They tell him, you know, you're a, a troublemaker. Um, did, did the cops visit him? I think the cops visit yeah, him. It was right? someone from the it's cop. Like, it's like place. the it's like the censorship. authorities. Yeah, censorship board. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. like, you write, written this offensive book. Um, you know, you're a troublemaker. We don't want you to do that anymore. And Zola, or the boss, tells Zola like, hey. You got to stop it. I'm going to keep you on, but you know, you get one more chance. And Zola's like, "Hey, I don't think so. I'm out of here. I'm leaving." You're a fat little jerk, and I'm yeah. I'm leaving. <laughs> so he's like, takes his fifty cents and he gets out of there. I did uh, like how we quit. Though he's like, "Thank you for giving me this opportunity to write more. I appreciate it." <laughs> so he's unemployed again. He's walking. He sees a woman jump into the river, and he's like, "Hey, well, shouldn't we save her?" And she and the guy tells him, "Like, she's no better than us sleeping on this." you know street um so we get kind of this montage of uh there was like a mining accident or this uh that was a cool shot by the way where it comes from the the flap of whatever it was uh, oh like yeah the canvas, good. and then yeah. it comes out and it's the mining shaft mm -hmm. that was pretty cool yeah and really good transitions in this Mm -hmm. he's like why yeah they did oh uh, he's like why weren't the safety doors closed and they're like safety doors we don't have safety doors <laughs> uh, <laughs> then that cop's like get out of here <laughs> osha <laughs> <laughs> safety um he tries to sell some more articles and stuff and the guy is like we can't buy this they'll give you 10 franc for it so he gets 10 franc Wrong. um we see a woman on the run. We kind of figure that these are some ladies of the night <laughs> um, running from the police. And uh, she runs into a restaurant. And before they can kick her out, Zola and his friend are there. And they're like, hey, come sit with us and order food with us. And so she kind of tells Zola her story. They go back to his place and she kind of explains what's happened to her and how she can't go back home. And this gives Zola an idea for a book, and he writes it, and it's called Nana, and it's a great success. Um, he doesn't believe it at first because he goes to his boss, and he's like, hey, can I get some more money? <laughs> I, I actually, this is actually one of my favorite scenes in the book, or in the movie, sorry. It was funny. It's when, he, it's when he comes up to the, 
uh, the bookseller and the bookseller is like, or he's like, can I just have like two francs? I'm sure it will sell well. He's yeah. like, it'll sell well. <laughs> sure? I know. I like, Are you sure? He's like, oh, it, it sold 36,000 copies. He's like, could I still have a few francs to buy an umbrella? Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to get wet again. <laughs> but I do no. like when he goes out to the umbrella. So I was like, I'll take a dozen. No, 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 no. I'll just take I one. What am I? I'm an idiot. <laughs> I like how the umbrella does the same exact one. thing. Yeah, the same thing. Well, okay. I also did like when he went up to or the umbrella salesman came up to him first. He's like, do you want a new one? He's like, you would deprive me of an old friend. So <laughs> that's a great line. But yeah, I did, did like that where he that, was like, oh, Mr. Zola wants a favor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that I, I really like that scene. So the book is a success, and we see that he sends the book um, to the woman that he based it on, and he puts some money in there. And this was a cool transition. I like this one because she like she's looking at it, and then there's all of a sudden there's shouts of war on the street. Um, so they're at war with the Prussians. Franco uh, Prussian War. Yeah, and they a talk very of- underrated uh, s- subject of history, by the way. Same. So. Zola and his like social group are talking about the war and they're like, you know, they criticizing it and Zola is criticizing it. And that kind of gives him an idea for a war book. Um, what was it called? The fall or something? The downfall. The downfall. There you go. Um, so he writes that and then it, it, it um, circulates to like the army and they're uh, not too happy with it. <laughs> I like the, the general staff. He's like, have you read this book? Look, I don't read books. I don't have time for that. Yeah. So. And one of them is, hey, hey, I can understand where he's coming from. We mm-hmm. kind of made some mistakes. And the guy's like, the army doesn't make mistakes. The army mistakes. doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> so they're not too happy with it. So they send the chief censor on him. So he's got to go meet with this chief censor. And he's like, hey, you can't be writing this stuff. And he's like, he you know, you can't censor me. I'll write what I want to write. And he does. He writes a ton of books. And like Thomas said, we see this kind of shot where all these books just start lining up and it's all the ones he's written. Um, Calm down, sir. So he's a success. They're having fun. They're eating with Paul. And they're like, this is just like old times. And Paul's not so sure about that. And he tells him that an artist should remain poor. Um, for the sake of the art and for the truth because uh, he doesn't think that Zola like how Zola's like look at this cool thing I got look at this cool thing I got and he's like dude you're fat now and you're yeah. <laughs> but so he like can't... Zola he's like <laughs> yeah he's like oh god <laughs> don't look at that so he t- so he questions Zola's artistic integrity uh, now that he's rich and famous okay so then we move on to the subplot where there is some stolen correspondence going on um basically there was a military attache i for the germans right so they're like trading secrets and we see that the secrets get stolen out of a mailbox so it happens the 120 millimeter gun yeah as I keep saying over and over again. <laughs> so we find out that there's a traitor in the military, someone that's been uh, leaking documents and strategies. So they're kind of, they've discovered that there is this traitor from the letter. So they're, tra- and they think it's coming from the office of the, what is it, like the secretaries or whatever. Mm-hmm. So they're like, uh, let's look at, the staffing for this and we, we can try to figure out who this is and they they go through the names and they they pick out this one guy and he's like that guy's interesting um because he's not he's not french he's from yeah, somewhere else hungary hungarian yeah. i think yeah and another guy's oh we can't do anything about that he's like the son of a rich guy and stuff like that so they can't pick him, but they can pick this guy, Alfred Dreyfus, who happens to be Jewish. It's like the only thing listed under his name. So they're like, hey, what's that's our man right there. Um, so we meet Captain Dreyfus. He's over there playing with his kids and having a good time. Um, that kid was loud, by the way. <laughs> I'm just saying. The kid? <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, we're like, because he's playing like with those army toys. He's like, here comes the barrage. And the, the captain's like, yeah. 
um, and then they so they give uh Dreyfus summons to come meet him and then he's got to wear his civilian clothes and the wife kind of feels that's kind of weird and it's early in the morning so why would they be doing that and he's like ah it'll be fine everything will be fine um so he heads down to a base or whatever i don't know where it is <laughs> he heads down to um his superiors and he's in his civilian clothes and he's got a cane and he's there this was kind of a like a funny shot or not a funny shot, a funny scene because everyone's like oh he's here he's coming yeah so <laughs> <laughs> even when they were getting the room ready the guy's like and they like hide like it's a birthday yeah, like party or something. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like they're gonna surprise him or something um so they bring him in and the guy has him take dictation for him and he's kind of writing the letter that was leaked and he's like, you're under arrest for being a traitor. And he's like, what? Um, he's like, I'm innocent. I didn't do anything. I've always been loyal, a loyal soldier. And they're like, take him away. Oh, they they give him the option to off himself. Um, and he's like, no, I'm going to prove my innocence. So they take him away. Uh, they search his house. And they find him guilty. There's like very little evidence, but they just go ahead and find him guilty. Uh, meanwhile, we get a, we meet our old friend Zola, and he's riding a bike around Paris and he's getting lobster. Um, I'm sorry, but that lobster was dead, Zola. Like that was not a fresh lobster. That he smelled the lobster, man. He smelled. <laughs> oh, then he uh, forces other people here smell. <laughs> uh, they see a mob. Saying um, they're pretty much want to kill Dreyfus um, and forget, you know, due process or anything like that. Um, Dreyfus is stripped of his rank, so they tear off all his medals and stripes and stuff like that off his uniform. Um, and then Zola, we go to another scene with Zola. He's he's being like pampered. He's sick. He's got a headache, and they're like pampering him and washing his feet and stuff. It's weird. Uh, he's very rich now. Um, Trifus's wife visits him in prison. She's sad because they're going to send him away. Uh, he's been exiled to Devil's Island. Um, and she's like, just let me touch him, man. And they're like, no, we have our own. <laughs> so they send her away. Um, so Zola gets a visit from... Oh, wait, I, I'm skipping ahead a little fast. They send him to Devil's Island, and three years passes, and we find out that this other guy, I forget his name, uh, he's like a colonel, and he's now in charge of information or whatever, um, and he discovers that there's a real traitor, that the, it was that one guy, a foreign guy, and you know he goes to his boss, and he's like, hey... Uh, this is the real trader, but the boss is like, hey, this is closed. We already dealt with this. We're not opening this again. Um, and yeah, and then um, Zola gets a visit from his friend. It's not Paul. It's a different friend. He's got like the long white beard. Oh, the, uh, yeah. And the he like tells, artists. yeah, he's like telling him um, He's telling him about how he Dreyfus did not look guilty when he was um, charged. And he says, and when they were taking him away, he's yelling like, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. And so the friend tells Zola this. And, well, yep. uh, he also kept saying, uh, uh, Vive la France, which is like, you know, long live France. And so yeah. he's like, why would, why would someone who's a traitor keep saying that? And he tells Zola, I like this line, he tells Zola, he says, I, you can't close the tomb on a living man. Um, but Zola's just like, you know, I've lived my life, I've done my suffering, you know, I just want to live in comfort now. Um, the foreign guy is declared innocent by the military because they're kind of trying to close the lid on this. They don't want anything to get out. Um, so they declare that guy innocent. Um 
Zola gets news from the Academy of Arts from France that he's going to be inducted into their little club. So he's happy about that. And But then he gets a visit from Madame uh, Trifis who comes and she's got the evidence from the colonel guy. And she's like, hey, look at this. Can you do something about this? You should take off his cause. And again, he's like, uh, I'm going to be in the Academy now. You know, I'm rich. I'm comfortable. I've done my suffering. I don't want to do deal with this. Um, but so we get this scene where he like looks at the letter and then he looks like all, at all the stuff evidence she brought him and he's like, he kind of changes his mind. And so the next scene is kind of this meeting of the press and Zola comes in and he's like, I'm going to explode a bomb. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to prove his innocence. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to write this open letter and I'm going to accuse the military of wrongdoing. And, you know, they're going to put me on trial for libel. Um, so that's exactly what happens. Um, the military guy says he's got special work for the underlings. So they're going to just fix it. So the public is totally against Zola. Um, they always come with this. Um, what did they say? Uh, put Zola away, something like they always chanting death to Zola or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the mob was kind of hard to make out because my yeah, the audio. Yeah, so I, all I could think of was, thing. yeah, all I could hear was <laughs> Zola. <laughs> Zola. Yeah. I'm like, I was like, they're <sighs> angry. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember what they're saying. It's like death to Zola or something. Uh, hang Zola or something like that. Um, <laughs> And then there's book burnings. They start burning all of Zola's uh, books and articles. Uh, they try to get him in the street because they see him. And, hey, that's the guy. So he's got to run away. Um, and we get to the trial. Uh, and then they give him the signal, which is to like start heckling Zola while he's, while he's on um, walking in the court and walking out. Um, they... Oh, there's a scene where we see Madame Dryfish. She gets a letter from her husband. It's all, or he gets a letter from her, and it's all censored, so he can barely read it. But um, she's still thinking about him, and, and they're on this trial trying to prove his innocence. Uh, she takes the stand, but they don't even let her talk. The judge, the president of the court, I guess what they call him. Um, she he every time they're like try to ask her a question he's like you can't ask, ask that because it has to do with the dry fish trial and we're done with that um so it's very frustrating uh the captain gives his testimony um which uh they say they have a secret document the military's got this secret document that can proves that dry fish is guilty uh, but their lawyer asks, like, can we see this? Uh, we're not going over through with this trial until we see this document. But the military does not want to show this document. Um, court is adjourned because the lawyer just lights up the judge. He's like, <laughs> you know, everything I try, you just squash. You know, you're not letting us talk at all. You're not letting us defend him. And the judges kind of just run away. They're like, court adjourned. Let's get out of here. <laughs> um, we see rain falling on Paris, you know, the famous shot of Parisians and their umbrellas uh, in the streets. Uh, and then at Zola, it's time to give his uh, testimony. So he gives this impassioned speech, uh, but it doesn't work because he's still found guilty. Uh, and he calls them cannibals. Oh, this funny. Um, so he's with his lawyers and they tell him, hey, you got to get out of France, man. You got to go to England. Um, he, and he's like, no, I should probably stay and do the right thing and serve my sentence. Cause he was sentenced to like one year. Was it one year? Yeah. Um, and they tell him, you know, sometimes it's more courageous to be cowardly. So he takes off for England. Um, and then there's a little bit of a change of the guard for the military in France. There's a new, uh, I think he's a minister of war or something like that. And he's kind of cleaning up, uh, cleaning up the military and he tells them, you know, like you, uh, he confronts uh, the Captain Henry guy and he's like, you know, you forged this. I know you forged this. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not admitting it. And then finally he does. Um, he admits that he did forge the documents. And then he tells the military guys, you know, there's no room for you in France anymore um, for people like you. Uh, 
a little girl wakes Zola up in the morning, a little English girl, and he's like all sick and cold. And he tells her, you cold-blooded English are going to be the death of me. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> um, also, like, we could definitely tell we're in London when, like, the newspaper's like, oi! Yeah. No lie in England! <laughs> uh, and then his friend comes in with the newspapers, and he's like, hey! Hey, it's good <laughs> news. Um, you know, the military has been found to be guilty of all this stuff. Dreyfus is going to be released. Uh, they tell him and and he's got like the long hair and he's like old scrawny looking um zola is taking the train home with his friends and uh we get a shot of him and his wife and he's still working he's got like new he you know after this he's just like on fire to right the wrongs of society and stuff like that so he's very impassioned to still work um, sadly, though, there's there's a malfunction with the um, fireplace, and we see him coughing a lot because the it's not leaving the building, and he's getting all this carbon monoxide in there, uh, and he dies mid sentence. Um, Dreyfus is acquitted. We see that, and he's reinstated. Um, and they're at a the ceremony and. You know, they, they congratulate him and, you know, they give him a reward. Um, we get Zola's funeral. Oh, before that, uh, Dreyfus is like, hey, hey, where's Zola? I thought he was going to be here. And they're like, and then this newspaper. And some kid's like, oi! Yeah, this newspaper <laughs> ran from England and he's like, Zola's dead. Um, so we get Zola's funeral at the end. Um and it talks about you know the truth and stuff like that and that is the end of the movie so ah that was a lot of talking so <laughs> i'm gonna let you guys take over and tell me what you thought of the overall movie so go ahead jared okay um i like i like the beginning like the first 30 minutes um i like the message of the movie um but I was checking out of this movie quite often. Um, like I said, after that 30 minute mark, I just didn't connect with Zola. Didn't really care after that point. And um, I just kind of lost interest. Um, so this hasn't been my favorite movie, but I do like the message of it. And I did enjoy the first like 30 minutes of it. Uh, so I'll pass it to uh, Michael. Um, I started off in that sense to where the movie started, and I was like, "Oh, I like I like these characters. I like what we're doing." Blah, blah, blah. But then I feel like the beginning of the middle of the movie, I was so bored. I was like, like it, it just kind of felt meandering. I was like, "What is the point?" Like we're skipping away to this other guy, and I didn't really know what you know the future held for drives or whatever. So I'm like, I don't care about what the heck's going on. Get a bunch of corrupt people, whatever, whatever. whatever. Then it kind of came full circle and brought everyone together. And I was like, okay, I'm back in on this movie. And maybe I'm just like a, a, a shoe in for like court movies, but I just, I get so tense and I love the speeches and I love all the people trying to stick it to them and everything. So I got really into this movie in the end. Um, definitely think it, it picked up a lot. It just needed, I think just a little bit of cleaning up in the middle. I'm just like, like they brushed through his career really fast. And it kind of got to, Oh, we got to be meandering. It, they honestly could have started with Dreyfus getting, uh arrested and then go from there and go straight into the trial and then you kind of get this maybe like a quick backstory of who Zola is but it, it, the beginning felt like almost like a different movie or like some prequel or something that we didn't need to see for the, the actual meaning of this story and everything because you're kind of like oh this guy got successful we're gonna move away from him and then we'll come back later and it could have just been like oh this really successful writer who likes to tell the truth is brought back into his you know passions and desires to tell the truth for this case could have been easier a shorter movie and more to the point but that was my only complaint really like i think performances were great i loved i love the tension in, in the courtroom scenes especially like with him like we're not talking about the driver's trial that's not allowed here we're gonna do, do, do stop 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 just every five seconds so frustrating but it just gives you that satisfaction i guess after the court whenever everyone gets acquitted in the end but uh yeah i really liked the the uh the pace like i said the second half of the movie and then like jared said the meaning of the movie was really really important and it's just it's it 
it just deals with that just like the sleaziness of like the, the that interesting idea of like the military being perfect i feel like that's such an interesting topic of them being like no we can't tarnish the people who fight for us because they have that that shield going for them and everything i don't know it's, it's a very interesting topic and i thought the movie handled it really interestingly because man how do, how do i put that that kind of difficulty of him like like that that journalistic guy who a lot of people with someone like that today would come out you'd be like oh they're crazy you know dude trying to spout I'm gonna say the word conspiracy theories, but uh, but in, in this case, and this man is actually like, you know, I've looked at the evidence, I've seen it, and dude, he's right, and it's just this corrupt military organization, and everything. I don't know. I feel like they handled it really well, and it's very interesting to watch. Man, I don't know how I don't, I don't know much more on that, but yeah, good, good, good shots. Good, like we talk about good transitions. I feel like the movie was shot really yeah. well. Just needed a little, a little cleaning up pace wise in the beginning, and I would have been been real on this movie. But yeah, thought it was really good. Uh, I was happy with the pace. Um, I think it was like an hour and 50 minutes, I think, something like that. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Um, wasn't bored, was pretty uh, hooked on whatever was, whatever somebody was talking, I was pretty much hooked in. Um, I like the, the prequel basically that we get in the first 30 to 40 minutes because it kind of sets up Zola and basically his background and character and who he was. Um, I think that if we didn't have that, we wouldn't quite have an understanding of who he was. And so just, and just to see where he came from and just how also the, the beginning part also shows the, the destitute that France is at this point. Um, Cause this is during like, this is right after Napoleon died. And this is like the second or third Republic. I forgot which one it third was. Republic. Is it a third Republic? Yeah, because yeah. they mention it. Yeah, and, and this is just... The, the government of France is crazy. Like, it, ever since the revolution happened, it's always been just like, okay, cool, what's it like today? Um, and just to see how... how he basically bucked against people who were taking advantage of, you know, basically no, there was nobody else to lead. So the, the military took over for a long time, and that, that was pretty much, oh, yeah, then... The military is the government. We can we can't do anything wrong. So it's very interesting to see um, how he was able to criticize the ruling power without basically being erased, which, you know, just like uh, black black hooded and taken away. Um, I think mostly because he was such a good writer, and a, a lot of people just really enjoyed his 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 writings. Um, and I think that uh, this kind of gets across the charm of zola and his writing um so I, I was i was really happy with this movie I, I i really enjoyed it um more so than some of the other other ones we've watched uh but yeah good movie yeah i really enjoyed it too uh like tommy said i didn't think it was boring at any parts uh i just I love this movie for the dialogue and for the writing. I thought Zola had a lot of good lines in it. He he keeps like repeating how the truth is gonna keep like rolling through like on a train or something like mm. that. Uh, I really enjoyed that. It's probably uh it has a lot to do with like the times we're living in where it just feels like there's no justice and a lot of I did, uh, sorry, I, I did like when the censor comes in. For the first time, I was just like, "Oh, look, we're getting flash. I'm getting flashbacks of 2020, where yeah. nobody could say anything against, you know, <laughs> the ruling power." It's like, "Oh, it's just repeating again." <laughs> yeah, so. it's it's nice to see where because we live in a world where like the corrupt get away with everything, so it's nice to see stories like this where you know justice finally gets the win every once in a while. Um, so, if not much for I mean, there's no like shots. There's not really many shots that jump out to me. Um, but it's just the dialogue and the writing on this movie was really good. And you know, it it could maybe like Michael said, it could be cleaned up at some parts. Uh, I'm a big sucker for transitions, though. Like when they do, when they're like, "Hey, over here, there's something going on." I love that kind of stuff. Um, so I like that. Um, but yeah, it's not like it's not probably the best movie we've seen, but I, I really enjoyed it and thought it was a worthwhile watch, especially you know for people who like history and stuff like that. 
definitely check it out. I would recommend watching this one. So, uh, any last thoughts on the life of Emil Zola? No. Was he murdered? Was he murdered? Yeah. Go check our, our video on that <laughs> weird stuff and see if we thought he was murdered or not. He, so The answers might shock you. <laughs> so. So our next movie comes from 1938, and it's You Can't Take It With You. So we will see you for that one. Like, watch me. Just just watch and let uh, uh, come back and watch Jared cry. Yeah, (laughs) Jared, we're almost there. We promise. We're We're never getting there. (laughs) (laughs) Like, subscribe, and notify yourself for even more good stuff to come. And we will see you next time. Bye.